This presentation is brought to you by Arizona State University's Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability and a generous investment by Julianne Wrigley. Well, let me begin. We all know something of our past and we think we know the present. And some of us may see the future as a continuation of both. If they do, they are wrong. Today I want to look a bit backwards, a bit sideways, a bit forwards, and venture into the long -term, longer term prospects for our species. First, let's establish the perspective. Humans are an infinitesimal part of the natural world. I think that um, the, the, the figure that is used is that we are 0.0007% of estimated living species. Each of us, a point that always strikes me as very interesting, each of us has 10 times more bacterial than body cells. And of course, our species is relatively new. No one was around to record the evolution of the first human-like creatures which came from ape-like ancestors in Africa some millions of years ago. They left eventually for the savanna, away from the forest, became relatively hairless, and walked upright on two legs with consequences for the physiology of their growing brains. By at least half a million years ago, they had split into a variety of related strains. Among them were the Neanderthals. We've all heard about the Neanderthals. And recently discovered the Denisovans from finding a useful bit of bone in Siberia. And another offshoot may still have been living on the Indonesian island of Flores as recently as 16,000 years ago, which I need to hardly tell you is a mere squeak in geological time. And so far, through analysis of fossils and work on current humans, we've been able to trace the genealogy of Homo sapiens back only some 200,000 years. All other branches of humans are now extinct, but many of us share at least a small proportion of their genes. Most of us sitting in this room have probably about 6% of Neanderthal genes in their bodies. Now, over the last 40,000 years, the human impact on the Earth has slowly and then rapidly increased. Hunter-gatherers fitted easily, although sometimes uncomfortably, into the ecosystems of the cold and warm periods of the Pleistocene epoch, the so-called Ice Age. People migrated in response to changing conditions, but farming with land clearance was only began between 10,000 and 8,000 years ago and that, of course, changed everything. With a vast increase in human population came towns, and with an even bigger increase came cities. Tribal communities evolved into complex, hierarchical societies, and for a rich variety of reasons, each such societies rose and fell, and usually, but not always, recovered. The pulse of civilization has always been irregular. Well, before the Industrial Revolution, some 250 years ago, which began in the island from which I come, the effects of human activity were local, or at most regional, rather than global. Now the impact is indeed global. Indeed, as you've heard, we have the idea of a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene, to mark the effect that human activity has had on the surface of the Earth and will have still more in the future. Well then, what are we to expect? How are we to recognize that the last 250 years, the period of the Anthropocene, have been a bonanza of inventiveness, exploitation, and consumption, which may not continue? All successful species, whether they be bivalves or beetles or humans, multiply until they come up against the environmental stops, reach some accommodation of the rest of the environment, and willy-nilly restore some balance. The penalties for not doing so can lead to collapse. Now, are we near to those stops? 
to judge from the current debate within the scientific community, some believe we are pretty close to them. This presentation is brought to you by Arizona State University's Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability for educational and non-commercial use only.